Good morning, everybody, and praise the Lord Church. My name is Patrick Massa, and welcome to yet another beautiful Sunday here at Deliverance Church, Makere Hill. On behalf of our lead pastor, Pastor Charles Obwana, thank you for joining us. At Deliverance Church, Makere Hill, we are a church community that seeks to see the nations discipled and equipped for kingdom influence. So even in this season, you can be part of the kingdom advancement. Welcome to Hope for Today. Friends, our hope for today is the Spirit of God interceding through us, declaring the purposes of God in our time, even when we are not aware of it. The Bible says, I have heard their cry. God hears our cry. We are not settlers in this world. Jesus said we are in this world, but not of this world. You need to use the very tool that God has put in your hands. Whatever assignment he has given you, whatever task he has given you, he has also given you a tool. Our God is mighty. The Bible says he's the Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and the end. The Bible says what he decides to do, he can do mightily. Every Sunday at 6 p.m. only on Google TV. Hope for Today is a broadcast of Deliverance Church, Uganda. Our very own High Praise Choir is here to lead us in a beautiful time of praise and worship. And as the choir leads us, don't forget to give of your tithe and offering. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. You can give through the available channels on your screen. Hallelujah! Hey. Hey.
ourselves strong. That's why we come today to testify and say hallelujah to you, God. Hallelujah to you, Lord. I cannot describe just how good the Lord has been. He has been so good. And now, all I have to say to him is that, Lord, all I have to say to you, God, is that you deserve, you deserve all the glory. You deserve all our praise. You've never failed us. You've never left us alone. You say, yea, though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you should fear no evil, for the Lord is with us. His rod and his staff are our comfort. And today we know that we have experienced this first time, this entire year. We have seen that even though circumstances seem uncertain, the Lord has been faithful. He has been there for us. Hallelujah. Oh. Oh, oh, oh. Oh. My hallelujah belongs. Hallelujah. My hallelujah belongs. 
Hello everyone, welcome to this uh, online service. We are grateful to God who has kept you safe to this time. Samuel Siminu is my name and I'm part of the leadership at Makerere Hill Deliverance Church. Since the beginning of this year, we have been pursuing a theme uh, that we are working through this season on and uh, today I would like to develop our discussion, our consideration towards a particular direction and that is strengthening our relationships so as to enlarge our territory. Previously, uh, we have had our leaders speak to us on these uh, various aspects of this theme on enlarging our relationships. And I would particularly want to recall what Pastor Nicholas Wafula shared with us a few weeks back um, on modeling our relationships, on the relationship in the Godhead as a foundation for successful relationships. He gave us a demonstration here on how a person filled with the Holy Spirit, a person who is in Christ, in God, and overflowing can overflow in influence. So it was a beautiful demonstration. For those of you who attended, you can recall. Fortunately, uh, we can find these videos still online. Uh, on our platforms and look at them again. The other person that spoke to us on this theme was Pastor Nobat uh, Tugume, and he did tell us that we are living in selfish times and that it is important for us to deliberately work against uh, this tendency, which is natural to us as human beings, to exclusively uh, focus on ourselves and our interests if we were going to live in relationship. Another person that uh, spoke to us was Elder Peter Idembe, who reminded us that without faith, it is impossible to please God. And that faith invites heaven into our affairs. And thus, it enables us to extend our godly influence in the world around us. So if we are going to enlarge our territory, he was reminding us, in relationships, we will need to exercise faith. And uh, um, earlier on, we had had Pastor Jackson Kaira, who uh, in talking to us about strengthening our relationships, had talked about the significance of the local church and our relationship with the local church as uh, an uh, impactor on how we perform as influencers. And so we have had this um, long exposure to this theme. Last Sunday, our sister Irene Chisaka shared with us and uh, emphasize the fact that God created us for fellowship. First with him and then with our fellow man. She also reminded us that our unity attracts God and his blessing. And she read Matthew 18 from verse 19 to 20, which talks about us coming together in his name and him being with us. She also reminded us that for us to have influence in the marketplace, we needed to grow to maturity in Christ Jesus. And quoting Ephesians 4, 11 to 13, she reminded us that gifts are given to us, uh, ministers are given to us, 
essentially saying church is given to us to build us up to maturity in Christ so that then we can exercise influence in the marketplace. So that is looking back at how far we have walked along this journey of enlarging our relationships. Relationships uh, vertical with God, relationships horizontal with fellow man at individual basis but also at institutional basis. When we talk about church, it's an institution uh, that has people in it. Uh, and then we have other institutions, family, and so on. Now, today, I would love to specifically focus on our vertical relationship. Enlarging your territory. Who is responsible? When Pastor Charles asked me to share on this, I immediately remembered uh, where our theme comes from, that's Isaiah 54. And um, from verse 2 to 3, it says, Enlarge the place of your tent and let them stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Do not spare. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes, for you shall expand to the right and to the left, and your descendants will inherit the nations and make the desolate cities inhabited. And here is God speaking to uh, the city of Jerusalem and picturing it as a barren woman at the beginning of that chapter in verse 1. But now he instructs her and says, enlarge the place of your tent. And he goes on to say, and let them stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. And when they talked of enlarging uh, your territory, I recalled Chronicles chapter 4, verse 9 to 10. A gentleman called Jabez, whom we have often uh, read and thought about. Mentioned in very few verses, just two, but then he has been a focus of many when it comes to enlarging. So Jabez, we are told, was more honorable than his brothers. This is in verse 9. And his mother called him Jabez, saying, because I bore him in pain. That's what his name meant. And Jabez called on God, the God of Israel. Oh, that you may bless me indeed and enlarge my territory. That your hand would be with me and that you would keep me from evil. That I may not cause pain. That's from the New King James Version. And the Bible tells us, and so God granted him what he requested. And here I was caught in a dilemma. Jabez asked God to expand his territory, his sphere of influence. At, him, at his time, it looks like it was basically a land that you took and occupied. Our territories of influence now may be slightly different. But he was calling on God, and we are told God answered. But in our theme, uh, our theme verse, God is talking to Israel, uh, to Jerusalem specifically, and he's saying, enlarge your place, your tent, and let them stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Now, who is responsible for this growth and enlargement, I was asking myself. In the case of Jabez, Jabez called on God. And we are told, God answered. So his territory was expanded and all these other uh, issues that he prayed about. God heard him and he answered. And now God is asking uh, Jerusalem to enlarge her tent and to stretch out her curtain. So it's like it, it is a dual responsibility. We don't assign God to do this for us. 
but we call on God to help us do it. And uh, that is why uh, it calls for interdependence instead of independence. If you try to exert your influence all by yourself, in your strength, with your knowledge, it will be your influence, not God's influence. But if you're going to be a channel for God's exerting God's influence, then you will have to depend on God. Talking about man's dependence on God, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish uh, of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. That was the purpose of God's creation of man, of you and me, to exert influence over all that was in the earth. And he was made in the image of God. We know the story of what happened and how we lost that picture and uh, lost control. So much so that by the time Christ comes, we are told the ruler of the earth is no longer man, but the devil. We lost it when we were lied to and disobeyed God. So we broke our relationship with God and came under the control of the enemies of God. And so our restoration of the relationship with God is what restores our dependence upon God and increases our capacity for influence. And so much so that God, in his wisdom, says when he came through uh, in uh, Genesis chapter 18, verse 17, when he came through to judge the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, he said, but how shall I hide this from Abraham, this that I'm about to do? He had been with Abraham. He was walking away after promising his wife a child. But now, all of a sudden, he remembers that um, he has a mission is going on. And it's like he has an obligation. And so Abraham engages with God, the angel of the Lord, to intercede for those cities. But if you just found this many, sometimes I think because he had relatives there, he was saying, my God, what's going to happen to my relatives? But a godly man goes beyond his selfish interests. Even if there were just other human beings I trust, as an intercessor, he should have uh, intervened in prayer. So God, in his wisdom, created man and gave him uh, control over the earth. And it's looking like he cannot just come in and do things in the earth without the cooperation of man. That's what we see in John the Gospel of John, chapter 14, from verse 9 uh, to 20, which I'll uh, give you to read and reflect on. So how do we reclaim our influence in the earth? Recently, uh, Pastor Nobat gave us uh, information about a group that has been recently formed uh, in Nua, Africa, to try and encourage uh, um, leaders to grow uh, in their ability to influence influencers. And he gave us uh, the areas that they look at, which is something that we have seen elsewhere. That is uh, the seven mountains of influence. These are the, uh, the areas that most influence our cultures around the world. Business, government, family, religion, 
media, education, entertainment. Uh, others say sports and entertainment. So we are saying when man fell and lost control of the earth, the devil came in and he took charge of these areas. And so reclaiming actually means engaging in warfare to take back what the devil had taken over. And it is in our relationship with Christ Jesus that we receive that power to fight and overcome the enemies of God. And so what does it call for? It calls for knowing the mind of God, knowing who you are in God's plan, doing what you have to do with all your might, maintaining the link with God himself, who is, uh, I've called the high command here. If it's the battle, there's a control, controlling authority, and it's God himself. And then we need to depend on God entirely. We are like a glove, and inside us is a hand that moves. And then finally, we need to let God take the glory. We shouldn't be working for our own glory. I'll share with us uh, a testimony of a brother who worked in just one of these areas. And um, it's out there. You can look it up. The brother is called Robert Henderson. And he was particularly involved on the mountain of governance. And he says when he began to pray for his country, God gave him a number of dreams, and he goes the details on which one came at what time. And so the first dream, he was instructed by a candidate to the presidency in his country, say, hold a conference for me. And when he went to God, God gave him a particular date on which to hold the conference and the purpose for the conference. And he told him, the purpose was to help shift things in the realm of the spirit, in the favor of this candidate. And gave him a specific date on which to hold the conference. He went ahead and did that, and the results were amazing. He actually saw his candidate overtake a very strong opponents and take the leadership. A while later, in another dream, the same candidate comes to him, now elected, and uh, assuming, about to assume the presidency. And in the dream, he tells this brother, be part of my cabinet. Because if I were the one, I would be excited that uh, the big man is calling me. But this was an assignment from God. And he realized that God wanted him to represent the cabinet of, this, of his country in God's heavenly country. And he did that faithfully. But when he has just started, he got another dream. Again, the president telling him, be my running mate. And it was like, in the next election, I am standing again, and I want you to be my running mate. He said, but that can't be. And God told him, yes, you have to go ahead to pray for the next term. And so he walked with his president, through that first term. Towards the end of the term, he says he had another dream. And in this one, he was playing, you know, silly games with the president, bumping him shoulder to shoulder until the president had to remind him to stop playing silly games and remember that this is the presidency of his country. And then he showed him documents about the economy and gave them to him. He understood that God was asking him to pray for the economy of his country because where they were going, the status of the economy was going to determine whether that uh, gentleman, the candidate, would return in the second term or not. And he said, I was a serious person. I'd never met this man we, all these years. I know I am his partner in the spirit. But to say I am playful, that wasn't it. 
then he understood that it was actually the, pla the church playing around with a very important office. And I don't, want to, I don't have to tell you what the results of that playfulness uh, have been so far. So what do we learn from this testimony? God wants to partner with us in whatever sphere of influence he has placed us in. And these spheres of influence are not just uh, limited to what you do uh, uh, in, the, in the world. Because you might be in business, but you are also relating with government. You have a family. You are in a church, so you are in a religion. You, you, you work with media, and so on and so forth. So it's important that you grow your capacity to influence. And this gentleman's testimony just tells us, for him, his call, he had other things he was doing, but his call was to represent the church uh, and God in government, and he did that. Let's look at another example, this time in Scripture. Um, in Scripture, in Proverbs 31, we read about this woman of noble character. This good lady um, was a model, not really uh, somebody that was real. So it shouldn't be taken as uh, um, the, 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 the one model that um, uh, uh, we can have for a woman of character. But... King uh, Lemuel, at the beginning of this chapter, says it's his mother who told him, advised him to avoid uh, certain careless behavior towards women, and then he goes on to tell him how to find a woman of character. And when I looked through this, I saw that this was a woman who had influence. He had influence at various levels. And we'll quickly go through this before we come to our conclusion. A woman of noble character who can find, that's verse 10, she's worth more than, uh, than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, no, not harm, all the days of her life. And that is influence in the fam at the family level. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She's like the merchant ships bringing her food from afar. Essentially, this is family but also uh, business. She trades to feed her family. She gets up while it's still night. She provides food for her family and portions for her, uh, uh, for her female servants. She's an employer. She has people she, she, who work for her, but she works herself very hard. Again, influence in the family. She considers a field and buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong uh, for her task. Business and family again. She sees that her trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. In her hand, she holds the, the distaff and grasps the spindle with her fingers. She's, she's in production, business. She opens her arms to the, to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. She's charitable. She's, you could say this is part of the religious uh, mountain that she's operating on. When it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. She, she makes coverings for her bed. She is clothed in fine linen and purple. Again, the family is, uh, is presented as uh, comfortable, wealthy because of her efforts. Her husband is respected at the city gate where she takes his seat, where he takes his seat among the elders, governance. She has influenced her husband to the point that he is one of the people respected in the management of the city. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies the merchants with sashes. This is again governance. 
She's clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and, is, and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She's educated and she's an educator. So she's operating on that mountain as well. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Many men do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive, and beauty is fleeting. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Again, the fear of the Lord. Religion comes in there. She, and the family in the earlier verse uh, from 27 to 29. Honor her for all that, she, uh, that her hands have done and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. What am I, point am I making here? That when you are rooted in the Lord and you, are, uh, you, are, you, you develop yourself in your knowledge of God, in your relationship with God, you get to a point where you are influential on all the spheres of life around you. So in conclusion, what do we see about uh, increasing uh, our influence as a result of our relationships? Ephesians 2 verse 10 says, We are God's handwork or workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God Prepared, uh, uh, prepared in advance for us to do. So essentially, we are born to influence. We are born and reborn in Christ to, domin uh, uh, to have dominion. We need to partner with God, therefore, uh, for his kingdom to come and for his will to be done in the earth, as we read in Matthew 6, 9 to 10. This then is how we should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We are incapable of extending that into reality if we don't grow in our vertical relationship with God. Let's pray together as we conclude. Holy God, we thank you for this opportunity you've given us to share in your word. We pray that it will yield fruit in each of our lives to the glory and praise of your name. For through Christ Jesus our Lord, we pray. Amen. God bless you.